10 years ago, fewer than one out of two people said they'd heard about global warming. Today, two thirds of the world population consider it a threat. In Great Britain, France and Germany, three quarters of the population say they feel concerned. Climate has become a major preoccupation. But the latest surveys reveal that one out of three people on Earth remain skeptical about the man-made origins of climate change. Among them are some highly influential political figures. Global warming and that, a lot of it's a hoax. It's a hoax. I don't believe it. No, no, I don't believe it. These official declarations are undeniably dictated by financial and economic interests. But despite scientific evidence, 100 million Americans and 70 million Europeans today sincerely doubt the element of human responsibility in global warming. How can we explain this reluctance to acknowledge what is so obvious? For Tali Sharat, a researcher in neuroscience, it has to do with the way our brain processes information. In fact, without realizing it, we're used to ignoring messages that go against our beliefs. Psychologists call this confirmation bias. If I think that vaccines are very um, effective um, and I read an article suggesting that it is, that will make me more confident. But if I read an article saying that it's not very effective, I dismiss it as, you know, not good um, science. We have 40 to 50 years of research that show that this confirmation bias plays a role in almost every important realm of our lives. In an online study involving hundreds of people, Tali Sharat showed that for someone who doesn't believe in climate change, a warning message does not have the same effect on their brain as it does on the brain of someone who does. We asked people, first of all, about their views about climate change. So we asked them different questions about, do you support the Paris Agreement, and so on. Based on those questions, we divided them into those that were a believers that climate change is real and is man-made, and those that are a bit skeptical. Participants were then asked to give their own personal evaluation of global warming. Unsurprisingly, those who believe in climate change predict a greater rise in temperature than climate change skeptics. But then Tali Sharat announced something to participants. Scientists have re-evaluated the data and concluded that the situation is much, much worse than they thought before and the temperature would rise up to 11 degrees in the next 100 years. The goal of the experiment was to evaluate how the two groups process this new bit of information. What we found was that those individuals that already believed that climate change was happening, they really took in that information into account and they upped their temperature estimates, right? So now they believe things are worse than they did before. On the other hand, those that were skeptical to begin with disregarded this information and didn't change their estimate much. Without realizing it, we all practice this selective thinking. Information that reinforces our convictions is treated with utmost attention. Information that goes against our beliefs goes straight into the bin. But what really happens in our brain to make us so disinclined to change our minds? To understand this unconscious process, Andreas Kappas, at City, University of London, went about trying to catch our neurons in the act of confirmation bias. To do so, Andreas carried out an experiment on pairs of volunteers. You're going to see pictures of houses. It's up to you to decide whether their actual value is more or less than the price you see. For each estimation, you can bet an amount of money, a large sum if you're sure of yourself, and if you aren't, you can lower the bet. The amount of the bet is a way of measuring the subject's conviction, how confident they feel about their choice. Mmm, that's worth more. I'm sure of it. I'll bet everything. Mmm, that's less. But I'm not sure. I'll lower my bet. 
The next stage of the experiment takes place in a brain scan room equipped with two scanners. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to reassess your evaluations, but this time you can compare them with those of your partner and change your own should you so wish. The result? When the assessments correspond, the participants gain confidence and generally increase their bet. On the other hand, when the assessments differ, they each ignore the other's choice and maintain their own bet. Confirmation bias in action. Here we see confirmation bias at work. We see what happens in the brain after a test subject learns that their partner shares their opinion. The brain specifically treats the information offered by their partner. This part of the cortex is known for its involvement in complex decision-making. On this side, we have an entirely different image. We see what happens in the brain when my partner contradicts me, when his opinion differs from mine, and what we notice is that we see practically nothing. Not much happens in the brain. It doesn't treat the information the partner offers, and therefore opinion does not change. Metaphorically speaking, it looked like the brain was shutting down, and it wasn't encoding the information coming from the disagreeing partner. So what this shows is that people are more likely to take information, evidence, whether it's true or false, that confirms to what they believe. And that makes them a little bit more extreme, right? They become more and more extreme, more and more confident, and it causes polarization. This functioning that is deeply anchored in our brain explains how hard it is for all of us to change our minds and obviously raises questions about the best way to communicate about the climate. When you try to convince someone that climate change is something we need to take seriously, it's important to remember that if you offend them by saying, you're wrong, I'm right, now listen to me, at that point, you've already lost them. What you need to do is find some common ground, something you both agree on, so that their brain stays engaged and they can actually listen to you. The polarization of opinions on global warming is at the heart of psychology professor Stefan Lewandowski's studies. In Brussels, Stefan works with the Research Centre of the European Commission to understand how digital technologies maintain and increase doubt on climate change. A hundred years ago, if you were living in a village in France somewhere and you thought the Earth was flat, everybody would look at you around you and say, well, whoa, what's wrong with that guy? Ha, ha, ha. Now, today, you go on Facebook and you say, the Earth is flat. And guess what? From somewhere around the world, there'll be another whole bunch of people who believe this. None of these people would ever find anybody else in their neighborhood who shares their belief, but online they can meet. So what is the role of the internet in climate change denial? How does it influence people's opinions? We know from a lot of research in psychology that people hold on to a belief to the extent that they think it's shared by others. If I think everybody else thinks the Earth is flat, then you're not going to talk me out of that belief. Because I can say, hey, what are you talking about? All my friends agree with me. And that is one thing that the internet has enabled. Stefan carried out a study on the comments posted on serious official science websites that discuss climate change. Comments that are often negative and far-fetched. The planet hasn't warmed in 15 years. Sorry, mate. Most of the warmest years on record have occurred in the last decade. The climate has changed before, yet we're still here. Everything will be just fine in the fullness of time. Yes, except Miami will be underwater. 
We call them zombie arguments because they're like the zombies in horror movies, you know. You keep killing them, but they keep coming back. These easily disproven comments nevertheless present a fundamental problem. They have a psychological impact. A questionnaire submitted to 400 participants revealed that they discredit the information published. When people are exposed to comments like that, they get the mistaken perception that everybody is denying climate change, and that then shifts their attitude. So the fact that these comments are out there has a measurable effect. By the way it functions, the internet influences opinions. The web has thus become the object of special attention, notably after important announcements concerning climate change, like Donald Trump's in 2017. In order to fulfill my solemn duty to protect America and its citizens, the United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. His announcement generated six million tweets. A quarter of those turned out to be produced by automated bots, for the most part favorable to Donald Trump. In the digital world, your opinion isn't only easily influenced, it's easily manipulated. Human beings are susceptible to the perception of the prevalence of other people's opinions. And for that reason, it must be very concerning that uh, there is a huge amount of disinformation about climate change out there. In his report to the European Commission, to fight against organized manipulation, Stefan Lewandowski recommends forcing online platforms to identify and block fake personal profiles that bias opinion in the climate debate. For those who are aware of the climate emergency, the never-ending debate without things ever really changing is hard to accept. But it's also a source of anxiety. In our view, where nonprofits are highly active in the ecological transition, overall inertia, as well as the difficulty of upholding one's own commitments, are topics that often arise in discussions. Two years ago, two of my friends were getting married, so that meant bachelor parties. Our group of friends finally decided all together, OK, let's do one in Lisbon and the other in Glasgow. In reality, you go for two or three days, so you take a plane. Obviously, that goes completely against what I know and what I do, my job, my commitment and all. But in the end, it didn't take me long to decide, thinking, well, no, I'm going with them. I set up my vermicompost and all, so I find positive good things. But I know that I do shitty things alongside that. And when my five-year-old comes home from school and says, Dad, is it good for the planet if we do it like that? I go, you're five, and you're saying that? There are kids who, for example, start crying at home because they see their mum come home with a, I don't know, let's say some groceries in plastic bags and plastic bottles. There's a dissonance between what I've just learned and the lifestyle I'm involved in. Among young children, these contradictions provoke a blend of distress and anger. A 14-year-old teenager I was talking to said to me rather aggressively, at any rate, you wrecked the planet. I can see that kids are completely lost faced with what they can have to do things, what they have to give up. I have four kids. And I honestly ask myself how we're going to be able to educate them in a way that they can collectively face the difficulties of the degradation of collective living conditions, conditions of accessing resources. Psychologists now talk about eco-anxiety. I am here to say our house is on fire. Greta Thunberg, the young Swedish ecologist engaged in the fight against climate change, embodies the disarray of this generation. Adults keep saying, we owe it to the young people to give them hope. But I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. A fear that sometimes borders on pathological anxiety. 